Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining a Chicago's Best Ideas talk uh, without any free lunch um, provided. Uh, and this quarter, our lineup of Chicago's Best Ideas um, will all involve a presenter talking about someone else's great idea, uh, a break from the old tradition in which people used Chicago's Best Ideas to talk about uh, their own ideas. Um, I'd like today to talk about the idea of a colleague, the ideas of a colleague uh, who has influenced greatly the way I think about uh, a really important issue in tax policy, and that's the role of tax havens. Um, and I think uh, Professor Dharmapala's approach to the tax havens question also teaches us something about the ingredients of a good idea in general. Um, so. I will try to explain the tax law and policy background here, um, but also use this as um, an exhibit for like what a great idea looks like. Um, and the idea is, I think, uh, probably simply stated, maybe tax havens aren't so bad after all. I mean, maybe they are, uh, but uh, maybe they're not, and we shouldn't be so quick to rush to judgment about the effect of tax havens on global welfare. Um, so I could have chosen a whole bunch of uh, ideas uh, if I were to focus on Dhammaka Dharmapala's Chicago's Best Idea. It could have been Dharmapala on hate speech. It could have been on sovereign wealth funds. It could have been on the structure of congressional committees. Uh, so this isn't uh, Professor Dharmapala's only great idea, but it is a great idea. Um, and it's an idea developed in a series of papers going back to uh, 2008, I think, is the first publication date, um, though some of these papers appeared uh, in mimeograph form uh, even before that. So it's an idea that's developed over the course of uh, a decade and a half. Um, so why are we talking about tax havens at all? Why do tax havens matter? Um, well, a recent estimate from Gabriel Zuckman at the University of California, Berkeley, and co-authors uh, is that about 10% of global wealth lies in tax havens, even though tax havens have less than 1% of the world population. So we're talking about a lot of money. Uh, and based on one estimation strategy, an estimation strategy that Professor Dharmapala has complicated and criticized, um, about 40% of multinational profits are shifted to tax havens. So this is pretty phenomenal if multinational companies are making 40% of their profits in countries that constitute 1% or less of the world's population. What is a tax haven? Uh, well, the OECD defines a tax haven as a country which imposes a low or no tax and is used by corporations to avoid tax which otherwise would be payable in a high tax country. So here we have a map of uh, the world's tax havens, the tax havens uh, being in red dots. Obviously this definition suggests a certain amount of wiggle room. Uh, doesn't have to be a zero tax, it could be a low tax. Uh, Ireland has a 12.5% uh, corporate income tax and is generally considered to be uh, a tax haven. Um, so in uh, Professor John Rapala's uh, 2009 paper with uh, Jim Hines, he comes up with uh, a list of tax havens uh, using a variety of uh, other tax haven definitions at the time. Um, I won't uh, read off the whole list, though I will point out um, a uh, overlap, substantial overlap between Dharma Paula and Heinz 2009 um, and the Beach Boys uh, 1988. Um, tax havens do tend to be uh, smaller uh, islands. Um, and that's not uh, entirely random. Um, as uh, we'll see in our discussion of havens here, um, Smaller countries may have advantages in being a tax haven. If you're going to reorient your whole economy uh, around being a tax haven, well, that's doable if there's not much rest of the economy to reorient, right? Whereas if you're a country of 
1.3 billion people, it's going to be harder uh, to change your economy to successfully be a tax haven. Um, and for your interest in remaining a tax haven to be sufficiently strong that you can credibly commit uh, to keeping this path. Um, we'll talk more about uh, the credible commitment aspect of tax havens in a moment. Uh, so why do tax havens attract foreign investment? Well, one reason is there's a low tax rate on income earned locally. Um, so the same business earning the same pre-tax profit in Ireland and the UK, I'd rather be in Ireland uh, because I'm going to pay less tax. Um, but tax havens also create opportunities to avoid taxes on income earned elsewhere. So multinational companies are using tax havens to avoid taxes on incomes that are earned in non-haven countries. How does this work uh, in practice? Um, well, the easiest profit shifting strategy is debt. Uh, Global Group uh, uh, contributes $100,000 to a corporation in the US. The US corporation makes and sells widgets in the United States and earns profits before taxes of, we'll say, 10x. The US now has a 21% corporate income tax rate, so it would pay a US tax of 2.1x. That's without the use of tax savings. Now let's imagine that instead of setting up US Corp, Global Group, or in addition to setting US Corp, Global Group also sets up Haven Co., which is in a tax haven country, uh, and puts 100K, uh, 100x into Haven Co. And then Haven Co. then lends 100x to US Corp at a 10% rate. Haven Co. and US Corp. are both owned by Global Group, both owned by our multinational. Pick your favorite multinational here. US Corp. makes and sells widgets in the United States, earns profits before interests and taxes of 10x. And now it pays interest to Haven Co. of 10x. Right? Uh, so uh, because interest is generally tax deductible, instead of having US income of 10x, now it has US income of zero, right? All of its profits are booked in Haven Co. Haven Co. is earning interest income on its loan uh, to, uh, to US Corp. Right? So just have your affiliate in the non-Haven country take on debt to your affiliate in the Haven country. Right? And the Haven country facilitates this by saying, okay, we're not gonna tax that. And I'm going to uh, pause here to, um, to ask, uh, does anyone have any, it's important that we understand the basic profit shifting strategies. So any questions so far uh, on how this is working? No, we're good. Okay. So that's the, the simplest uh, profit shifting strategy. Here's a somewhat more complicated one. Now let's imagine a company, we'll call it Global Bucks, and it opens a UK cafe. Uh, and the UK cafe sells cappuccino uh, for three pounds. Uh, and for each three pound cappuccino, uh, UK cafe pays uh, one pound in rent and wages, uh, buys beans from an unaffiliated distributor for one pound, and earns a pre-tax profit of one pound. The corporate tax rate in the UK is 19%, so it pays a uh, tax to the UK of 19 pence. All right, now let's see how tax havens fit into this. Now imagine that Global Bucks establishes uh, Haven Co. Uh, and Haven Co is going to buy beans from the source and sell to Global Bucks affiliates. Uh, and instead of uh, Haven Co. Buy, uh, instead of UK Cafe buying its beans for one pound, now it's going to buy its beans for two pounds. Right. So again, it pays one pound per cappuccino in rent and wages. Now it pays two pounds to Haven Co. for the beans. Right. And all the UK profit has gone away. Right. Where has it gone? It's gone to Haven Co. Right. This company in Haven Co that's buying and selling beans is making a profit on every transaction and that profit is taking away 
UK cafes, UK profits. So the profits are shifting from the UK to the Haven country. Nothing is actually changing about where economic activity occurs in the world. The same cappuccino is being bought in the UK. The same beans are being sourced from Colombia. Right? But the profits are magically shifting to this tax haven. Uh, instead of these transfer pricing games with commodities, we could also play transfer pricing games with intangibles. So by a transfer pricing game, I mean we're inflating the price of the beans that uh, UK Cafe is buying from its distributor in order to shift profits to another place. So we can do it with trademarks, right? Uh, Global box instead of uh, uh, doing what it was doing before, could transfer its IP to Havenco. Its IP being the Global Box name, the Global Box recipe. And now we'll have UK Cafe buy those royalties and licensing, uh, buy, buy that IP from Havenco. So uh, UK Cafe uh, is paying Havenco to get to use the Global Box name. And again, we're shifting profits from the UK to this haven country. And just to be clear, this is what Starbucks does. Right? Uh, Starbucks for several years was paying nothing uh, in UK corporation tax and is now paying a very low rate in UK corporation tax. Right? How is it doing this? Uh, by buying beans at inflated prices, by taking on debt to Starbucks affiliates in Haven countries, uh, and by buying uh, the rights to Starbucks trademark, Starbucks recipe uh, at high prices from affiliates in Haven countries. Okay, so what's in it for the tax haven? Uh, the tax haven isn't taxing uh, these profits. Like that's how you become a tax haven, you don't tax. Uh, so what's in it for the tax haven? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, Starbucks is probably going to put some people in the tax haven in order to manage this tax haven business. It's going to put money in tax haven banks. Um, Ireland uh, has pursued this strategy particularly effectively. Is that the only reason why Dublin is booming? No, but uh, one incentive for Microsoft and Google to have employees in Dublin uh, was because Microsoft and Google had lots of affiliates in Dublin who were doing these sorts of transactions. And then some of them often started their own businesses right, and created a booming tech scene. So this is a way of bringing people with disposable income and skills to your country. And a lot of these tax havens now are like pretty nice places. Uh, Mauritius is now uh, the richest country in Africa. Is it entirely because of its tax haven status? No, but it's a great stimulus uh, for growth. Even though the growth isn't coming from tax collected, right, it's coming from all the other benefits of having multinationals based in your country. So uh, in his work on tax havens, Professor Dharmapala asks a bunch of questions that after they're asked, they seem kind of obvious, but he was in many cases the first person to ask them. Um, so one of those questions was, well, why doesn't everyone become a tax haven, right? If it's so awesome to be a tax haven, why is it just these you know, 30 or 40 odd countries? Uh, why don't we all uh, get into the game? Um, someone suggested that uh, we might uh, be uh, frozen on PowerPoint. So I'm going to stop the share for a second uh, and then uh, resume. Uh, thumbs up if you right now see why doesn't everyone become a tax haven. Thumbs up. Great. And thanks for uh, the, the message via chat. Uh, well, the answer is it's actually not that easy being a tax haven. Uh, 
in order to be a tax haven, you need to be able to credibly commit to multinational enterprises that you can come here, right? Come to Mauritius, come to Ireland, come to the Grand Cayman, uh, and we're not going to expropriate your assets here, right? And uh, in his 2009 paper with Professor Hines, Professor Dharmapala looks at uh, the determinants of tax haven status. Which countries are more likely to become tax havens? Uh, and two aspects that matter a lot are population and the quality of your governance. Uh, so better governed countries are more likely to be tax havens. Right? We might think of tax havens as these global pirates. They're actually very well governed pirates. Uh, and smaller and better countries are, uh, can more easily commit to uh, remaining tax havens, to staying the course. We're not gonna jack up profits, or we're not gonna jack up the tax rate to 99% once you locate all of your assets here. And again, being small helps uh, because that means that the tax haven portion of your economy is a larger portion of your economy. So it's similar to why is Delaware so successful in corporate law, in attracting corporate charters? Well, well one reason is because like 16% of Delaware state revenue comes from corporate licensing and franchise fees. And there are a lot of corporate lawyers in Delaware uh, who, and employees of corporate law firms and other people who are connected to the corporate law world, uh, who are vo gonna vote against uh, any change to Delaware law that's going to undermine its status as a uh, corporate governance hub, right? A similar phenomenon for tax havens. So it helps to be small and it helps to have uh, structures of good governance. And interestingly, uh, cutting taxes is only linked to more foreign investment in well-governed countries. So if you're a poorly governed country, and this is also from Professor Dharmapala's 2009 paper with Professor Hines, if you're a poorly governed country uh, and you try to attract foreign investment by cutting your tax rate, Starbucks isn't going to come there, right? Starbucks doesn't want to have its assets in Zimbabwe uh, because Zimbabwe has, uh, Zimbabwe being a country that has gone through uh, lots of political turmoil recently uh, because uh, uh, it doesn't take the current commitment to be credible. Uh, so well-governed countries can make credible commitments not to expropriate foreign investors. They tend to manage their economies better. Uh, they tend to have better court systems. So that's one big uh, insight from uh, uh, Professor Dharmapala's work so far um, that uh, you know, it's not so easy to be a tax haven and better co governed countries are more likely to be able to do it. Um, Sohil, I saw you uh, raise your hand and let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, or if, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I can unmute myself. Great, perfect. Uh, my question was, do you have to have your assets, let's say your assets are cash, do they have to be in a bank account located in the tax haven? Or does the corporation just need to be registered in that haven and you can have a bank account in a different territory? Uh, great. So I, I think that that is a great question. Uh, why, uh, why would there be expropriation risk um, if uh, we uh, did uh, open an account in, if we, if we did create a company in Zimbabwe? Um, you probably would have to have some people in Zimbabwe, right? or some people in a tax haven country. Um, uh, but it, it, it will very often be the case that, and Professor Dharmapala will intervene if I am uh, wrong about this. Um, but the fact that you are uh, a Grand Cayman uh, uh, company doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a Grand Cayman bank account, right? Um, that said, moving assets from one country to another, even on paper, isn't, it's not trivially easy, right? So uh, if, uh, you know, a few days before the close of the taxable year, uh, uh, Mauritius increases its tax rate from 1% to 99%, it's not clear that you're gonna be able to get your profits out in time. Um, but 
uh, you're not necessarily reliant on the financial institutions of uh, the Haven country. Um, it does help to have good banks uh, around. All right, so the, the second question that Professor Don Mapala asks is, uh, why don't multinationals shift all of their income to tax havens? We understand now why not every country can just become a tax haven, but like, why only 40% of multinational income in tax havens? Why not 100% of multinational income in tax havens? And again, 40% may be an overestimate uh, of the amount. Um, one is uh, that there are just non-tax frictions. Right? If you're going to actually have to move people uh, to Dublin, uh, well, there's a limit on how quickly you can get people to pick up and move to Dublin. Dublin's an extraordinarily nice place. So if you told me I had to pick up and move to Dublin uh, tomorrow, I'd check to see whether that was an essential activity. And then if it was, like, sure, yeah, happy to go. Um, but part of it is non-tax frictions. Uh, part of it is tax planning costs. Um, and part of it is source and residence countries, i.e., uh, in the global box example, the UK is the source country. Right? The income is uh, being generated in the UK. Uh, and the countries in which these multinational corporations are headquartered put legal limitations on income shifting, on profit shifting. Well, that raises the question, if, uh, if the source and residence countries can put legal limitations on profit shifting, like why do tax havens exist at all, right? If the non-haven countries can shut this down, how does this game work? And if you're ever in a position where you're running uh, a large non-haven economy, uh, and you need to crack down on tax havens. There are a few really good tools that you can do, that you can use in order to achieve this. Um, so one is uh, controlled foreign corporation rules. And the US has these CFC rules. And as Professor Dharmapala has shown, countries are increasingly adopting CFC rules. If you're a US, head a US headquartered corporation, will say, we'll tax you on all the passive income of your non-US subsidiaries. We'll just do it. We'll just say, OK, if Haven Co. is earning passive income, not generated by activity in the Haven country, we'll tax you on that. Uh, so now, uh, when Haven Co. books, when, when, when Global Bucks books profits in Haven Co., we're just, we're just going to apply the US corporate tax rate to those profits. Uh, now, in practice, the United States has uh, established lots and lots of limits on its own CFC rules, right? So we've uh, created loopholes in our own CFC rules. But conceptually, we could just say, okay, we're taxing Haven Coast passive income. Uh, that works if you are the headquarters of the multinational corporation. Um, if you are the source country, so let's say you're the UK in the Starbucks example, we could say, well, we'll only allow you to deduct the interest up to X percent of earnings before interest and taxes, or we'll only let you deduct interest on debt up to X percent of capital. There's no rule that we need to allow interest to be infinitely deductible. So uh, here was our uh, earnings stripping through uh, interest example before. The US uh, in the December 2017 tax law said, we'll only allow interest deductions up to 30% of earnings before interest and in taxes. So uh, instead of getting to deduct 2.1x uh, uh, here, will say, look, you can only deduct interest on uh, uh, 7x rather than 10x, right? Uh, if you have 10 earnings before, uh, before interest and taxes, right, we're only going to allow you 
to sorry, we're only going to allow you to uh, allow you to deduct three x of interest, right? And we're going to we're going to consider the other seven x to be taxable income. Right? So we'll tax you on twenty one percent times seven equals one point four seven x. Maybe from an accounting perspective, you've got zero U.S. income here, right? But uh, because you're deducting all of your interest against your uh, income, but we're forget we're ignoring seventy percent of your interest deductions. We could do that. Um, hey, we could ignore one hundred percent of your interest deductions. We have other tools to crack down on profit shifting to tax havens. Uh, so one is uh, anti-inversion rules. Um, the U.S., dating back almost two decades ago, passed a set of laws that imposed an exit tax on U.S.-based companies that tried to re-headquarter elsewhere to get out of U.S. tax. And the Obama administration significantly strengthened these rules through regulatory action, through no uh, additional action on the part of Congress. Uh, so if you're a U.S. corporation and you want to move abroad uh, in order to get around our CFC rules, okay, um, we can just say no. Or we can say, if you want to go, you're going to have to pay an exit tax. And Starbucks, uh, you know, even if it didn't want to be U.S. headquartered, it wants to continue to have U.S. stores, right? So it doesn't want to openly defy U.S. tax authorities because then I'm just going to take their stuff. Another possibility uh, is uh, we could avoid some of these transfer pricing problems through formulary apportionment. And the idea of formulary apportionment is, well, let's say a third of your sales are in country X. Then country X will tax a third of your worldwide profits. We're not going to try to allocate income to each individual subsidiary. We're just going to say a third of your sales are here. We're going to assume that a third of your profits are here. Or instead of making the formula based on sales, we could make it based on sales plus the location of your workers, or sales plus the location of your workers plus the location of your assets. And if this seems uh, like a zany idea, it's already what we do in the state income tax context. Right? So when Illinois taxes uh, a uh, taxes Walmart, uh, it's calculating what Walmart sales are in Illinois. Uh, and then it's taxing Walmart on that portion of its profit, right? And it's not allowing Walmart to play transfer pricing games between its Illinois and Indiana stores. So uh, we understand why uh, not every country can become a tax haven. Um, but like non-havens just say no, right? They could, uh, and Professor Don Rapala's work also shows that when they do install these CFC rules and they want them to have bite, they do have bite. So non-haven countries can raise more in uh, revenue from multinational corporations and they choose not to. Why? Uh, well, so one reason is maybe we actually don't want to tax mobile capital. Um, so, uh, if capital is mobile uh, and the global after-tax rate of return on capital is 5%, then country X imposing a 50% corporate income tax means that capital is only going to move to country X if the pre-tax rate of return is 10%. So we've got some corporation. It's deciding whether to invest in country X. Right? It knows that half of its profits in country X are going to be taken by country X in income tax. Then it's going to say, gosh, why would I earn less than 5% after taxes in country X when I could earn 5% in country Y? So it's only going to choose to invest in country X if it's earning at least 10%. Right? That's if capital is mobile, if it can move easily across borders. So when country X imposes a corporate income tax and corporate capital is mobile, who bears the burden of country X's tax. Well, it's not going to be the corporation. The corporation is going to get its 5% return. Otherwise, it's not going to invest there. Right? It's going to be the men and women of country X. So that's the case for mobile capital uh, in 
the classic public finance model. What about immobile capital? Well, immobile capital we can tax in the United States, right? Uh, if you are a smaller US business or a US business with no foreign investment opportunities, um, then we can potentially, or a, a business who, uh, because of what you're doing, you just gotta be here, right? Um, then we can potentially tax you a lot without you shifting assets overseas. So ideally, we would like to distinguish between mobile capital and immobile capital, right? and tax immobile capital more. How are we gonna do that? Well, we could say, hey, everyone, raise your hand if you're immobile capital, and we're gonna tax you a lot. Right? But distinguishing between immobile capital and mobile capital isn't easy. One way of doing that is by allowing multinational companies to shift income to tax havens. And the, country, the companies that are sufficiently mobile that they can move assets to Ireland or to Mauritius will do so. And the immobile guys will stay here. And that way, we can actually tax immobile capital more. When we tax mobile capital more, we lose it on global capital. Right? Um, so by allowing tax havens to continue to exist, we can increase our tax rates on the people who can't leave. Uh, and uh, we reduce tax-induced distortions because of this, right? When a company actually moves physical assets from one place to another, uh, then uh, they are producing less efficiently than they were previously, right? Uh, so a nice thing about tax havens is the real-world distortions caused by tax havens are relatively small. The UK cafe can continue to remain in the UK. Yeah, a few people might have to move to Dublin or Bermuda or uh, Mauritius. But if London is the best place to be opening this cafe, we can still open it in London, even though the profits are being bo booked in Ireland or Mauritius. So that's one reason why non-havens might allow tax havens to continue to exist. Another is sometimes profit shifting is really in our interest. Uh, so let's go back to this Global Bucks example. And let's assume that Global Bucks is headquartered in hypothetically Seattle, Washington. Well, when Global Bucks shifts income from the UK to Haven Co., who benefits? Well, some of them might be US based shareholders, right? And if the choice is between the UK government getting money, and Howard Schultz getting money. Like Howard Schultz is American, we'd prefer that he get money. Uh, and the shareholders in Starbucks are uh, a lot of US pension plans uh, and US institutional investors. My guess is the University of Chicago owns some Starbucks stock. Right? Uh, so when members of Congress, like their constituents are more likely to be Starbucks shareholders than to be the UK government. Uh, so allowing our own companies to use tax havens in order to shift income out of, say, the UK uh, is uh, potentially good for us. And uh, almost every country allows uh, its multinationals to claim a foreign tax credit for, cre for taxes paid to other countries. Right? Uh, so when a US corporation pays tax to uh, the UK and then brings profits home, we allow it to subtract the tax that it's paid to the UK from what it owes to us. Well, when it books profits in Haven Co rather than in UK, it's not getting any foreign tax credit, so it's paying us more. And if we shut down the Haven Co opportunity, then Global Bucks would have no incentive to shift profits from the UK to Haven Co. It would just let the UK tax. So uh, by allowing tax havens to exist, we allow our own multinationals to reduce their tax burden, uh, which benefits their shareholders, which tend to be based here. Right? And potentially we collect more in tax revenue as a result. So 
we came into this thinking, well, tax havens are going to be really bad for non-havens. One, they might actually be good for non-havens because they help non-havens distinguish between mobile capital and immobile capital. And they'd like to tax mobile capital less and immobile capital more. This story about non-havens allowing their own multinationals to use havens in order to get out of still other non-haven countries' tax, it's less obviously in the interest of all non-haven countries. Maybe it would be better if the US and the UK agreed to let the US companies be taxed in the UK and let the UK companies be taxed in the US. But the havens here are a bit player in this game. It's a collective action problem among non-haven countries, but not an irre uh, irresolvable problem created by the existence of havens. So uh, one of Professor Dharmapala's greatest uh, uh, phraseologies coming from this is, if tax havens did not exist, it would be necessary for non-havens to invent them. And to be quite clear, there's a lot of evidence supporting the idea that not all countries can become tax havens, uh, that better governed countries are better able to succeed as tax havens. Uh, and that when non-haven countries decide to tax multinational profits, they can. That's the evidence base. We don't have smoking gun evidence of members of Congress or of the Treasury Secretary saying, you know, I could crack down on tax havens, but I'd like to be able to distinguish between mobile and immobile capital. And Professor Dharmapala is quite careful in saying where there is evidence supporting the theory and where uh, the theory is a logical intuition based on the evidence, but not itself uh, derived from the evidence. So here's a model of the existence of tax havens that accounts for uh, the fact that non-haven countries could shut these down. We know that it, it, most of you haven't taken international tax, but most of you now understand the tools that you can use to shut down tax havens. Uh, why aren't members of Congress using these tools? Well, now we have a potential explanation. So what makes this a Chicago's best idea? Um, well, uh, some members of my family uh, taught at the University of Connecticut, uh, as did uh, Professor Don Rapallo when he wrote some of his uh, papers on the subject. So they might say, this is a like University of Connecticut best idea, not a Chicago best idea. We claim as Chicago's best ideas, uh, all ideas of people who are currently in our building, even if they emerged elsewhere. Um, but I think this is a Chicago's best idea uh, in uh, still deeper ways. Um, we sometimes describe Chicago's best ideas as counterintuitive. I think they're really counterintuitive intuitive. If an idea remains counterintuitive, uh, then it's not an awesome idea, right? Uh, we want, I mean, we, we have a model of the way the world works. Um, and if uh, the micro foundations of an idea require a very different model of the way that the world works, then maybe that idea is not a particularly good explanation of the world. Right? Uh, the, the nice thing about this is once you think about it, yeah, it's intuitive. But it's not, it is initially surprising to think that tax havens might exist because non-havens have allowed them to exist, right? We tend to think of tax havens as these leeches sucking off, off profits from non-haven countries. It is based on theory and evidence. We don't have the smoking gun of members of Congress saying this, uh, but we do have the smoking gun of CFC rules like kind of work when you really try to use them. Uh, and we do have the smoking gun of uh, limitation and interest deductions do work when you really try to use them. And exit taxes on companies that try to invert do work when you really try to use them. It starts from a rebuttable presumption uh, that people are smart and self-interested. Uh, that is not uh, an ironclad law, right? uh, but uh, others begin from the assumption that tax havens exist because non-havens haven't figured out how to shut them down. 
well, gosh, I mean, there have to be some smart people leading some non-Haven countries. That feels like maybe only sort of true in 2020, but at previous points in history, we've had smart leaders in charge of the US and the UK and uh, other non-Haven countries. Like, why didn't they figure this out before? Uh, so I think a Chicago's best idea generally starts from the assumption that people are smart unless proven otherwise, rather than people are stupid unless proven otherwise. Right. And here's a theory of how smart and self-interested non-Haven countries could allow tax havens to exist. And it's an idea that's engaged with the real world. It appeals to those of us who live off in theory land um, because it is uh, so elegant. Um, but non-haven countries have to decide policy with respect to tax havens. Um, and if tax havens really allow us to collapse, more in revenue from immobile capital, then that's an important thing to know, right? If uh, non-havens uh, and havens exist in a mutualistic rather than parasitic relationship, then that's going to affect the policies that we adopt toward haven countries. All right, um, there was a lot there, uh, and I realized that uh, many of you have uh, a lineup of uh, Zoom classes and talks today. Um, so I will uh, stop there and open up for, for questions or comments or corrections from Professor Dharmapala. So, Hill. You mentioned uh, the difficulty of setting these up and that sometimes that outweighs companies' decisions to do that. And then you also mentioned how even the companies that can't afford to do it or can get through the intricacies maybe might not want to because they're not large enough. I guess you didn't say large enough, but what right, would right. be reasons they wouldn't want to? Right, so I mean, so, uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, and uh, part of it is there's, uh, there's a fixed cost uh, of doing it. Um, uh, part of it is, um, uh, if you're ultimately going to repatriate the profits soon and bring them home to shareholders, uh, then there's less of a benefit of, I mean, the December 2017 tax law changes uh, some of this, um, but uh, there's less of a benefit. Like if, I, if I'm an LLC uh, booking profits in uh, a uh, tax haven country, if I'm a, or a proprietor, I try to book my profits in, tax haven, in a tax haven country, and then I bring them home. We still have an individual income tax in the United States, uh, so the government can uh, catch it then, right? We still tax dividends in the United States, so the government can catch it then. Um, so there's the fixed costs, there's uh, the, the notion that the benefit is primarily um, a deferral benefit. Um, and they're gonna be, uh, some uh, uh, companies uh, that have less uh, transfer pricing wiggle room than others. Right? Um, the uh, corner convenience store can't attribute all of its revenue to IP. Uh, whereas like Google and actually Starbucks too can attribute more of its revenue to patent or, uh, or to trademarks. Um, and I mean, another fixed cost is you need, you need you guys, right? You need clever tax lawyers uh, in order to do this. Uh, and um, if you're a small enterprise, uh, then uh, the scale economies of hiring tax planners don't look awesome, right? Uh, whereas if you're Google or you're General Electric, this is all uh, a rounding error. Josh? Hi. Um, so, uh, isn't there a more cynical version of this story where the reason that policymakers in non-haven countries don't choose to crack down on the havens is not so much that they believe it's in like the best interest of their constituents who are shareholders and more likely that they just, uh, sort it's due to the outsized influence of those corporations in our political process. I mean, maybe at that point, it's not a Chicago's idea because it's, uh, you know, it doesn't assume that they're making rational choices, but. No, no, no. I, th I think uh, 
uh, the outsized influence of corporations in the political process, uh, there's nothing, I don't think, in, uh, uh, I don't think that's like an anti-Chicago idea uh, uh, in any way. I mean, however we define our core set of Chicago ideas. Uh, yeah, I mean, political processes bend to uh, the uh, interests of powerful uh, groups. Um, so, so then the question arises like, well, if corporations can just cut the corporate income tax, why do they need uh, to bring tax havens into the process, right? Um, you need something more than just uh, corporations win, right? It could be uh, this is um, a, uh, a complicated way uh, for corporations to win, right? In which case, like that's still useful to know that uh, uh, the tax haven countries are intervening variables here, right? And Professor Dharmapala makes clear that he's not saying that the use of tax havens is always in the interests of the non-haven country, but rather are in the interests of the non-haven country as construed by the political processes of the non-haven country. Right? So it may be that one of the reasons why mobile capital gets a lower tax rate in the haven in the non-haven countries is not because of the small open economy model, but because mobile capital has greater political power. It's still the case though that tax havens, rather than us seeing them as parasites that are leeching off of uh, uh, the non-havens, uh, this approach uh, sees them as, as tools being used by particular political actors in the non-haven countries. Ramon? Hey, hello. Um, so my question is why, uh, it was very clear why we, we have tax havens, but why do we have more than one tax haven? Why do we have multiple tax havens? If what is in consideration is the tax requirement in, in one jurisdiction and the government's quality, the courts and stuff like that, it would we can assume that there is one place in the world which is best for everything. So why do companies kind of like go to different tax havens and then don't we see like Delaware, um, one jurisdiction that everyone goes to, to that and only one tax haven? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, and Professor Dharmapala, feel free to uh, interject uh, at any point. I mean, one, we might say that uh, this is, uh, well, I, I will let you, uh, Professor Dharmapala, I will let you answer this. It's a great question. Um, and the Delaware analogy is, is, is really um, uh, relevant here, but, but at the same time, uh, the, uh, another way that people look at this is, you know, why, uh, the, they, they often view the small havens as being indistinguishable from each other. Um, and one might say, well, if there's only one haven, right, if, if Bermuda was the only haven, then the Cayman Islands would have an incentive to get into the same business. Um, and so why do, so it's not, it's, it, there's, there's gonna be entry into the business, uh, into the um, business of being a tax haven, uh, which means we'd have multiple uh, we'd have multiple um, uh, different havens, and, and they're probably close enough uh, substitutes that this doesn't really, um, that, that there are no, no great barriers to entry. So, so but maybe that's one way to look at it. Another is that there seem to be, there seems to be geographical clustering of haven, of, of um, haven activity. So U.S. firms might tend to use Caribbean havens that actually tend to be not that far geographically from the U.S., uh, European firms tend to use Mediterranean <laughs> havens that aren't too far from them. You might wonder in a, in a globalized world where we're, we're all talking to each other on Zoom from you know, wherever, wherever we happen to be, why should this matter? Um, and that, that's a good question. I'm not sure that we really know the answer to that. Um, but it, uh, part of it could have to do with specialization by law firms and accounting firms. So the, the US firms sort of learn about the um, laws of a, of a a handful of Caribbean jurisdictions, and they use those and, and so forth. Um, so I, I think the um, uh, 
the, the main, um, so I, I think that that's a very interesting intuition that, that you bring up. Um, and that is a, uh, suggests a difference between the uh, competition for, for corporate charters within the US across different states and, um, uh, and tax havens. But I, I'd say the barriers to entry are low, um, at, le at least if you are a well-governed jurisdiction that's small, so you don't have you don't have a big domestic corporate sector that that your public wants to tax. Uh, so the barriers to entry are low. Then, then you have this this geographical clustering, so that even if you only had one haven per geographical region, you'd still have multiple havens. Um, but in fact, you have we have multiple havens per geographical region. As well. we, we see we see a similar I mean why doesn't if Kirkland and Ellis is the best law firm or if Sullivan and Cromwell is the best law firm like why doesn't everyone just use Kirkland and Ellis right? uh, and specialization helps to uh, account for that uh, we tend to think of competitive markets as uh, the norm rather than uh, the exception um, uh, like we're at a law school so uh, it's worth also considering uh, legal languages right it's a lot easier for someone from uh, the UK to understand Irish law, uh, which are or someone from the US uh, to understand US Virgin Islands law, um, and uh, and language probably I, I would I would guess uh, matters too. Though uh, Professor Dharma Paul will tell me uh, if that's wrong. If I'm in uh, multinational with primarily French speakers, uh, easier to interact with a French speaking jurisdiction. Yes, no, geographical pro proximity matters more than we, we think it might, and, and so so does sort of cultural prox proximity, uh, right? And, and I suppose we're all in this new new world where we're all the, we're all interacting online. You know, the, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about the about the limitations as well as the possibilities of. Uh, well, depending on how this la how long this lasts, there might be no corporate profits to shift anymore. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I see a um, uh, uh, question by a chat, um, which is uh, why, um, uh, what about middle income non-haven countries, right? What about, uh, say, a country like uh, Portugal? Uh, does Portugal benefit from uh, the existence of uh, havens? Um, I think actually uh, there's uh, an argument that uh, havens are going to be more useful to the Portugals of the world uh, than to the U.S.'s of the world. So this model in which uh, the entire corporate income tax is borne by uh, own country residents, like workers in uh, uh, the uh, source country, um, is based on the idea of a, a small open economy um, and its own tax rate isn't going to affect the global rate of return, right? And for capital, this small open economy is like virtually indistinguishable from other economies, right? Um, and like, that's only sort of true uh, for the United States, right? Uh, we, there are a lot of enterprises that they're gonna come to the United States. US policy might influence uh, global rates of return. Um, but if you're Portugal, it's much less likely that your corporate income tax rate is going to affect the global rate of return on capital uh, and much more likely that multinationals will consider you uh, to be um, an almost indistinguishable investment opportunity from somewhere else. So we're deciding whether to locate our factory in Portugal or Spain. Uh, that you know, maybe if we're uh, doing biotech R and D, we need to be uh, in the Route 128 corridor in Massachusetts or in Silicon Valley or the North Carolina Research Triangle, right? But if our factory could be anywhere, um, then the incentive for the economy to distinguish between mobile and immobile capital is even greater. Right. There are going to be some businesses in Portugal that can only exist in Portugal. Uh, and uh, but then a lot of businesses that are a lot of multinationals that are investing in Portugal, for which Portugal is in like very close competition uh, with uh, other potential investment opportunities. 
Um, so it might actually be the case that the model works better for uh, the small the the, the smaller non-haven economies rather than the larger non-haven economies. On the, insofar as uh, non-havens are distinguishing between, uh, sorry, non-havens are using havens to distinguish between mobile and immobile capital. Now there are obviously fewer multinational corporations who are headquartered in uh, middle-sized or middle-income non-haven countries. So insofar as havens are being used uh, by uh, non-havens to benefit their own shareholders and increase their ultimate residence tax. That's a uh, uh, explanation that works better for the US and UK than for say Portugal. Uh, Sohil? I understand that we've had tax holidays, but how much of a potential future tax holiday weighs on corporations' decisions today? Uh, well, so, so the... Um, Another possible way of uh, doing a Chicago's Best Ideas on Professor Dharmapala's work would be Professor Dharmapala on tax holidays. Um, uh, so uh, the, the world's leading expert on the subject uh, can, uh, can interject at any point. Um, but I think holidays figure uh, importantly into uh, the analysis. Um, one of... Uh, if we have CFC rules uh, and uh, we tax the passive income uh, uh, accruing to CFCs, then the m advantage of keeping money offshore uh, is not clear, right? Like why not bring all of your money home today? Um, and uh, the classic explanation is, well, if we're gonna tax corporate profits when they're repatriated, um, then uh, co companies are going to want to keep money offshore until uh, the uh, until a repatriation holiday happens. Right? Um, uh, so if a residence country could credibly commit never to have a holiday, uh, then uh, there would be less of an incentive to keep cash uh, offshore. And what the December 2017 tax law did uh, was uh, something called deemed repatriation, uh, where uh, for a portion of offshore corporate profits uh, of US headquartered companies, it said, we're gonna tax you as if you're repatriating today. It doesn't actually matter whether you keep the money in Ireland or bring it back to the United States. Uh, we are gonna deem you to have repatriated it now and tax you now, right? So it was like the anti, it was the opposite of a corporate uh, tax holiday. It was like a corporate tax work day. I think it's probably also uh, important to emphasize that when we talk about offshore cash, right, whether it's being held in an Irish financial institution or a Swiss financial institution or a US financial institution, it's often being reinvested in global equities markets, right? So Google can be buying stock in, other in a portfolio of companies uh, out of a CFC that is located in Ireland. The cash doesn't actually have to remain like inside Dublin. All right, there's a uh, question uh, uh, via chat. Is it typical for the US to give bailouts to companies using tax havens uh, like President Trump is uh, currently considering for uh, many cruise lines? Uh, great question. Um, and uh, cruise, the, I don't fully understand the world of um, cruise regulatory arbitrage. Uh, there are like a range of different admiralty law considerations that cause ships to be chartered, like flagged in uh, different countries. Um, but uh, lots of US multinationals use tax havens uh, and then get the benefits of uh, US bailouts. So I think, I think the answer is like, is yes, um, we do bail out. Uh, we, AIG used uh, offshore entities for a whole variety of reasons uh, and got uh, a big bailout uh, in 2008. Um, uh, what I think is more unusual about uh, the cruise line case is 
we have the possibility of bailouts to uh, to non-U.S. companies, right? To companies whose mothership isn't based. Uh, mothership was a confusing way of describing it in the cruise context. Uh, isn't based uh, in the United States. Ramon, did you have a, another question? Nope. Anyone else? All right, great. Well, um, I realize many of you have another class to run off to. Uh, so, uh, well, I should get uh, Professor Dharmapala anything to, uh, to add or corrections to make? No, I, I appreciate you doing this and appreciate the uh, great uh, questions from the audience. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thanks uh, and uh, enjoy your afternoons.